Barker Ridge, northwest of Ellis Peak, 8,500 feet above sea level. Traces of winter still cling to the escarpment here, but diminish with each passing day. All along the crest, it is the same. The snowpack releases its water by measured drops, where it begins a long journey across a vast watershed. It percolates through boulder fields and scree. It flows over sheets of granite and bursts over thundering waterfalls. Today, the runoff flows through developments, over parking lots, roadways, carrying with it all kinds of material, like oil, dirt, and other chemicals. It washes gutters, runs into storm drains, into streams and rivers. And finally, it empties here, into one of the most spectacular mountain lakes in the world, Lake Tahoe. There, each drop of water will remain for more than 700 years. Lake Tahoe is, in a way, a time capsule, for what we put into it will be reflected in its waters for generations to come. Tahoe acquired its astounding beauty in large part from its geologic beginnings. Millions of years ago, massive fault blocks within the Earth's crust moved, forming a deep valley that slowly filled with runoff. At 6,223 feet above sea level and ringed by the northern Sierra Nevada, Tahoe is often called the jewel of the Sierra, its crystalline cobalt waters set within a bezel of pure granite. The discovery of gold in 1848 and the ensuing rush to California left Tahoe remarkably unspoiled. But the silver discovery in Virginia City several years later changed all that, unleashing a hunger that would devastate the basin's forests. If you can imagine the thousands and thousands of acres of forests that are located within the southern half of the basin, these forests were literally stripped of timber within less than a decade. So within less than 10 years time, the forests were basically removed from the south end of Lake Tahoe. The Comstock's appetite was short-lived, but voracious. In roughly 30 years, over two-thirds of the basin's forests were logged, and close to two billion board feet of lumber consumed, enough wood to build 150,000 homes. The collapse of the Comstock ruined the timber industry in the valley. Demand fell, logging operations slowed down. By the turn of the century, the lumber business shut down completely, and the era of exploitation of the basin's natural resources was over. In the aftermath came what many call Tahoe's golden years. The watershed around the lake began to heal, and the sleepy alpine community began to develop its permanent industry, tourism. Post-World War II boom was unprecedented. Soon Tahoe was overwhelmed by runaway growth. Hotels, supermarkets, high-rise casinos, and urban sprawl, characterized by a suburban-like strip at water's edge. The natural beauty that once attracted development was now at risk. The pristine waters began to cloud. No one understood why. When I first got to Lake Tahoe, I was amazed by the clarity of the water and uh, the fact that it was one of the clearest large lakes I'd ever seen. As I noticed the development uh, increasing around the lake, uh, I actually became concerned about the future. Uh, so we began to make, uh, in 1959, the first measurements of clarity in the, in the lake. And I was amazed at uh, how actually clear the lake was. Uh, we had a uh, secchi uh, depth of some 30 meters in those days. And of course, since then, uh, we've lost a third of that. For 40 years, Goldman and his colleagues at the Tahoe Research Group 
devoted their work to understanding the complex dynamics between the lake and the surrounding basin. They have recently been joined by scientists from the University of Nevada, Reno, the U.S. Geological Survey, and the Desert Research Institute. Together, they have assembled a volume of knowledge that is unparalleled in environmental studies. So vast is the data set that it now serves as the foundation for planning and management throughout the basin. Uh, for an ecosystem as complex as Lake Tahoe is and as sensitive to change, we need really a holistic approach. It's going to require the concerted efforts of a team of well-coordinated scientists providing the best data to the managers to resolve this problem in our lifetime. Tahoe lies at the bottom of a very deep basin. Radiating around it are 63 tributaries that drain the surrounding watershed and dump into the lake. The water carries with it everything that can be washed away. Lawn chemicals, sewage, organic matter, sediments of all kinds. These ingredients act as powerful fertilizers, stimulating plants and animals to grow and clouding the water like soup. Historically, Lake Tahoe was nutrient deprived. Very little could grow in its clear, frigid waters. During the last 50 years, as development increased, so did pollution. Sediment loads grew, nitrogen and phosphorus levels skyrocketed, and algae bloomed. Since monitoring began, there has been a steady increase in algal growth in the lake. This growth almost exactly mimics the decrease in clarity. When I arrived at Tahoe in, in 1958, Tahoe was a classic western lake. You got algal growth in direct proportion to the nitrogen that came into the lake. The ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus was about one to one. Now the ratio is about 40 to one, which means that the lake has accumulated so much nitrogen, and actually over 50% of this right out of the atmosphere, mainly from vehicle exhaust, that the lake has changed. It's now more like a Midwestern lake and is sensitive to phosphorus. This is a problem and also an opportunity because unlike nitrogen, phosphorus has no gaseous phase, so it can only come in from land disturbance. So if we can control the erosion directly from the watershed, the streams, if we can control a runoff from the roads, we can control the phosphorus loading and level off this eutrophication problem, this greening of Lake Tahoe, uh, in our lifetimes. Nitrogen and phosphorus are everywhere in the basin. Nitrates from fertilizers that keep the golf courses green, nitrous oxides from engine exhaust, and phosphorus latent in the soil. We call this area the Ward Badlands. Andy Stubblefield treks through an erosion-torn landscape few humans ever see. At 8,500 feet, this portion of the Ward Creek watershed is one of the basin's worst polluters. Well, badlands is actually a technical term referring to an area of deeply dissected topography with, uh, as you can see, a lot of ravines and gullies. Most of the watersheds have reforested, and uh, there's a very stable soil matrix. But here, there's very little to hold the soil in place. So when a rainstorm comes down, the soil goes with it. During the annual snow melt, Stubblefield makes this hike once a week. He estimates over 40 tons of sediment washes into the lake from the Ward Badlands every spring. Tracking how and where sediments get into the lake is no easy task. Scott Hackley, a staff researcher, knows this well. For the last 17 years, he has waded through streams, trudged through snow and ice to collect samples for the many studies underway. Currently, we're monitoring about 10 sites around the basin, and uh, uh, we've done this over several years, and so we have a real good record of the amounts of nutrients carried by streams year to year. Okay, this is a sample from the uh, water chemistry. Bob Richards directs the field laboratory at Lake Tahoe. Every 10 days, he collects a battery of water samples directly from the lake. He says while tracking specific points of pollution, like streams and creeks, is worthwhile, the vast majority of the pollution that enters the lake is non-point specific. 
It is coming from the entire watershed all along the 72 miles of shoreline. A non-point source pollution is, is sort of an accumulation of uh, pollutants that come from not a defined source. It's coming from many sources. And uh, it, it tends to be between, for instance, stream inflows. It will be urban runoff and stormwater runoff. Uh, it also comes from many sources in the air, uh, from automobiles, from uh, farming in the Central Valley, California, and many other places as well. The samples are used in over 20 different studies. They are carefully cataloged and analyzed for chemicals like benzene, MTBE, mercury, for organisms like algae and plankton, and for inorganic compounds like nitrogen and phosphorus. All the data reinforces a frightening fact. Tahoe is losing one and a half feet of clarity every year. And if nothing is done to reverse this trend, Tahoe will become a turbid, ordinary lake in a single generation. The band of haze that develops over the lake most evenings is clear evidence of the air pollution plaguing the Tahoe Basin. It's certainly much better than most of California, but it's also much worse than in fact what it should be at a mountain place like this. Now, the basin is a unique place. It has a very large lake, okay, and mountains around it. And so during the nighttime, the air slides down across the lake, across the highways, across the cities, and it goes out over the water. And then hangs there all the way till about 11 o'clock in the morning. And then at 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock, the wind comes up across from the Sacramento Valley and blows through the basin and then blows it all out into Nevada. And then it repeats again every night. Extremely stable, reproducible pattern of air, of air motion. Lake Tahoe lies downwind of the two biggest urban centers in Northern California, San Francisco and Sacramento. But even more hazardous is locally produced pollution, engine exhaust, wood smoke, even road dust. As the air slides across the highways and across the cities, it picks up pollutants, nitrates, phosphates, and the like, puts it over the water, then holds it close to the water all night long, and the stuff goes from the air into the water and acts as nutrients. And this then is part of the problem then in the fact the lake is turning greener. Optical equipment has been installed in a number of locations around the basin. One site is here at the D.L. Bliss State Park near Emerald Bay. These stations measure particles in the atmosphere and their impact on visibility. By comparing data from other sites, researchers can determine how much pollution is generated from outside the basin and from within. 22 million people visit Lake Tahoe every year. Automobile use exceeds tens of millions of vehicle miles. But it's not just the hydrocarbons and nitrous oxides that are sent into the atmosphere. It's dust, abrasives, sand, salt, cinders, all applied to the highways during the winter to promote traction on the icy roads. They are pummeled and ground ever finer and sent into the air. When the dust settles, it's in the lake. Uh, we're seeing a, an accumulation over time of very, very fine particles. And they're not really biological particles the way an algal cell would be looked at. Uh, they are inorganic particles and they, they tend to stay in suspension for a very long time. Advancing development and congestion in the valley foothills 60 miles away is a near perfect ozone manufacturing machine. That boom is a blight for Tahoe's forests. South Lake Tahoe is the only city in California where the ozone has ridden steadily over the last 20 years and the ozone of course affects the Jeffrey Pine because it damages the needles. We finally seem to track the ozone rise to the development along Highway 50 and Highway 80. In the afternoon, the cars are driving and they're putting in nitrous oxide and various hydrocarbons into the air. At high temperature, this is blown up the hill and converts to ozone way high in the mountains. And part of that dumps into Tahoe. The thing about air quality is, you know, you have to pollute every single day to keep the air quality bad. If we flinched, if we did not pollute for two or three or four days, this place would be pristine. The point was the air quality, unlike the lake, can be cleaned up very rapidly. The ecosystem most altered by human land use is the forest. In the late 1800s, more than two-thirds of the basin's forests were logged. In the early 1900s, 
fire suppression began. In the 1950s, rapidly increasing development brought forth an ever-shrinking habitat, erosion and pollution. Today's forest is a far different one than existed two centuries ago. It has been altered so much that scientists suspect its biologic integrity, a term that attempts to explain the overall health of the ecosystem, has been compromised. If a vegetation type or an ecosystem is healthy or has integrity, that it's able on its own to withstand droughts, to withstand unusual climate periods, to withstand ground fires, to withstand pressure or, or, or um, stress in all kinds of ways, and then to bounce back after the stress is released. It's, it's kind of a self-maintaining system. And in the absence of that integrity, um, the system unravels so that the stress causes a change and the, and, the, and the community doesn't bounce back. Historically, over half of the forest within the basin would have been old growth. Today, it is barely 5%. Over here. Younger, predominantly fir forest, is far more dense than the forests of yesteryear, less drought tolerant, and much more vulnerable to disease. And the adult burrows in and causes this engraving, and then the larvae will grow out and feed in the, in the bark of the, of the tree. And you get enough of these attacks on a single tree, the tree dies. Dave Rizzo, a plant pathologist, studies the spread of disease and insect infestation within the basin. And this is a host response, kind of like the immune system of a tree. Um, and the host is, the tree is trying to push the beetles back out. Rizzo explains that pathogens like bark beetles are a natural and welcome part of the ecosystem. But when they become epidemic, it's a signal that other forces are at work. The scolitis on the white fur is actually not an incredibly aggressive beetle rarely attacks a very healthy tree. So that what happened during the 1980s and early 90s during the drought was these things attacked all these stress trees. Test plots at various locations around the basin reveal 20 to 25 percent of Tahoe's forests are now dead or dying. What we have in the Tahoe forest now is two or three times more mortality than we would expect. Uh, so, is this a healthy forest? My answer is no. It probably lies outside of normal range of expectation. It, it, it means that uh, we're probably mismanaging the forest. As large tracts of forest die back, the real threat is fire. Ironically, years of suppressing fire in the Sierra Nevada has created a menace. Estimates reveal that a wildfire today would burn severely, killing 50% of the forest in the fire zone. When you suppress fire, you allow the vegetation to become more dense, and the fuels or litter, the sticks, the twigs on the ground to increase, so that actually you're creating a situation so that when the next fire that comes through that's inevitable uh, occurs, it's going to burn even hotter than before. So in suppressing fire, you actually may be contributing to increasing the likelihood of catastrophic fires. Historically, fire was commonplace. Many of the fires that occurred historically and naturally had much uh, lower intensities and the flame lengths didn't kill all the trees and, and therefore it wasn't a menace. The forests that get thinned by fire tend to be more resilient to drought or insect responses. So there's a lot of aspects of, of fire that, that make the forest healthier. The use of fire is not without controversy, however. Current plans call for burning during the spring and summer when wind can carry the smoke out of the basin. But summer days provide the highest fire danger, low humidity, dry fuels, and strong erratic winds. Thinning the forest must rely on mechanical means as well. An intermediate step is to come in and harvest the young plants, pile them in a, in a pile of slash, burn it separately, and then come through and do a prescribed burn. And only after those several steps could you then go back to burning every 20 or 25 years as used to occur. Forest health in the future may literally be a trial by fire.
Writer Suzanne Bentley describes Lake Tahoe as a place where civilization and wilderness collide. As we survey the transformation of this watershed, it's obvious two mighty forces brutally forging a new equilibrium, a balance that tries to support a natural ecosystem and continued human use. Although this struggle has been ongoing for the last 150 years, it's been in just the last few decades that the key battles have been waged. After years of conflict and bitter litigation, the economic and environmental interests, groups often at odds with one another, began to realize the benefit of working together. The keystone to building consensus was good scientific data. Scientific research plays a critical role in uh, conflict resolution here because when we are trying to develop uh, action plans, when we're trying to figure out what we can agree on, having a solid basis of fact is absolutely essential. Since the late 1960s, the basic theme of the UC Davis Tahoe Research Group has been research applied to ecosystem management. That commitment is reflected in scores of environmental projects and policies throughout the basin. We regulate um, development based on what science has told us about the impacts of impervious land coverage on water quality. We know that every time you disturb a natural landscape and then cover it up with some sort of impervious surface, that that has water quality impacts. And so we're able to use a, a system of gradually allowing additional impervious coverage in the Lake Tahoe Basin, at the same time implementing other programs that are designed to mitigate those impacts. Perhaps the best example of the successful cooperation between scientists and policymakers is the recent ban on two-stroke watercraft engines. Studies conducted by UC Davis, the University of Nevada, Reno, and the United States Geological Survey revealed that gasoline pollution was directly linked to certain watercraft. In high traffic areas around the lake, pollution levels violated not only California drinking water standards, but the federal EPA values as well. Tau Research Group predicted, based on the data that was generated, that there would be an 80 to 90 percent reduction in gasoline in Lake Tau if the carbureted two-cycle engines were banned. They were banned, regulations banned them, and, and, and that's exactly what we've seen, is an 80 to 90 percent reduction in, in gasoline in Lake Tau with that regulation. So it was, it was incredibly successful. Regulation and planning alone cannot save Lake Tahoe. More private land must be converted to public land. Historically, we're best known for acquiring because we early on undertook a massive acquisition program to acquire lands and make sure that they could be held in public ownership for future generations. The California Tahoe Conservancy has played a major role in reversing property ownership in the basin. Before 1950, 80 percent of the land around the basin was privately held. Today, nearly 90 percent is in public hands. Well, land ownership, of course, uh, secures the future. It allows you to control how those lands will be used for generations to come. One of the most important goals in the basin is the restoration of wetlands. This project on Cold Creek transformed a man-made dam and putrid lake bed into a fully functioning wetland with over a mile of meandering stream and fish habitat. Another project here on the North Shore is converting a concrete and asphalt dump into a broad meadow and a clear running creek. Although these and other projects show tremendous progress, there is still much to do. We have to recognize that we are a tourism economy. Tahoe is a destination resort. It has been for a long time. We assume that it will be. This is a billion dollar resort economy here, a billion dollars a year. Our goal is to make sure that that kind of visitation happens in a way that is sustainable and in balance with the natural environment and protects the very resource that the people are coming here to see. Tahoe as we see it today is not a study or a lesson in preservation. It's really an exercise in carrying capacity, in how we can include humans in a natural environment and sustain that for generations to come. On a bright summer afternoon, Alan Haver peers into Lake Tahoe's past. From the muddy bottom, almost a quarter mile below, he isolates layers of sediment deposited into the lake hundreds, even thousands of years ago. From these cores, 
He traces the life and health of the lake. So the amount of sediment that gets into the lake each year is a good measure of how much watershed disturbance there is. As erosion rates increase, sedimentation rate increases. From these sediment cores, we can tell that sedimentation rates dropped dramatically after the Comstock logging ended. The lake improved itself. That tells us that even after catastrophic degradation, this lake has the capacity to recover. Rings of hope that the current efforts to stabilize and restore the Tahoe watershed can make a difference and save the lake from further degradation. Lakes are reservoirs of history in the sense that they accumulate in their sediment record a record of whatever's happened on the land. We've been able to reconstruct the soil pollution resulting from the Comstock mining period. Uh, we can follow the emergence of tetraethyl lead. Uh, we can even follow the accumulation of mercury from industry. And future generations will be able to look back at the sedimentary record of Lake Tahoe and see how well or how poorly we did our job. Tahoe has a very long memory. Thank you. 